Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Washington Hill, and we'd like to welcome you to our Lunch and Learn virtual webinar series. We are so sorry that we're unable to meet and greet and be with you all as we have in the past years, but unfortunately because of COVID and the usual issues, we cannot do that. So the planning committee got together and decided how can we best serve our community as Healthy Start agencies and still share information. And so this Lunch and Learn uh, was born. We will have a series of five Lunch and Learns on the next five Tuesdays, starting at noon and ending by one. So grab your lunch, find a comfy seat, and please join us. We'd like to thank our sponsors as shown on the screen, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, District 12 here in Florida, who have been so helpful to so many of our efforts in the past, now, and in the future. And we'd like to thank Drug Free Charlotte County, who has been a supporter and will continue to be a supporter as well. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first uh, series. The topic is COVID-19 pandemic response and its impact on behavioral health. Our speaker is known to most, if not all of you, and he is PJ Brooks, who is now the Chief Operating Officer of the Community Assisted and Supported Living Program. And most of us know him as a former Vice President of Outpatient Services at First Step of Sarasota. Just a few words about PJ, Pete, PJ, for those who don't uh, know him, he's an accomplished behavioral health executive and forward-looking strategist with over 30 years of providing leadership and development of programs that assist people in need of intervention across a broad continuum of care and multiple environments, including pregnancy. A highly respected subject matter expert in the field of behavioral health, and don't we need that now? He's a proven communicator from the boardroom to the front desk and in the community. A roll up your sleeves leader whose coaching style develops employee loyalty to the organizational mission and vision. And he has done that for us at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. The one who is turned to to get things done. Without any further ado, PJ, the floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> All right. Um, what I'm going to do, Sarah, are you ready for me to go ahead and share the screen? Let's see. Oh, you're going to do it. Okay. Now, do I have control? That's a good question. Um. You wouldn't, I, I would need to move it forward. Okay, you're my Vanna White, that's fine. You'd be Vanna, and I'll just okay. tell you when to turn. How's that? Sounds good. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm honored to be presenting today. Um, you know, this is uh, my third time having to do a presentation via Zoom, and it's a bit weird and awkward, and, you know, just, it's just, it's just dang weird, bottom line. Um, but it's it's workable. Um, but it really gets to kind of what kind of the impact that we're going to be talking a bit about with regard to behavioral health. Um, you know, we're we're in a dynamic right now where everything we're doing is a precedent. There is no clear path. No, you know, I mean, we can. I mean, literally, we have to look back to like 1918 to have any understanding of what 
uh, or how our country should behave around the pandemic. Um, and that isn't even close to what we have to deal with now because of all the different dynamics that we're experiencing because of social media, the politics, and everything else in between. So um, go ahead, Sarah. All right, what you see here is the, um, the Mental Health um, Association screening hotline. This is data from, from them. And again, this is just a snapshot of, of what they're experiencing related to um, the impact of uh, COVID on anxiety and depression. Uh, since the beginning of the worry about COVID in mid to late February, there has been at least 88,405 additional positive depression and anxiety screening results of which had been expected, um, over, over what had been expected. In the comparison, they used November 2019 to January 2020 as the baseline. Um, there's been an additional 54,000, over 54,000 uh, to moderate to severe depression and more than 34,000 additional moderate to severe anxiety screening results from late February through the end of May. Again, I think this is stuff that everybody anecdotally would expect. This is not surprising many of us. I think this is consistent with what we've been experiencing here locally. The, peer, uh, the per day number of anxiety screenings completed in May was 370% higher than in January. And for depression, 394% higher in May than in January. Um, now here's the, the, one of the most important pieces. The impacts on mental health are more pronounced in young people under 25. So it fits a lot of what we're trying to address within the, um, uh, here locally related to the Here for Youth Initiative, First Thousand Days, ASAP, you name it. Uh, roughly nine in 10 are screening with moderate to severe depression and, then, and eight in 10 are screening with moderate to severe anxiety. Then up next. Okay. Um, since, uh, since, okay, go ahead, next slide. All right. And then also related to that more profoundly, we want to talk about suicide and self-harm uh, with regard to what people are thinking currently. Loneliness and isolation is cited by the greatest percent of moderate to severe depression, 73%, and anxiety, 62%, in the screeners as contributing to mental health problems right now. These percentages have been steady since mid-April. Despite a dramatic jump in screeners, these are, when we say screeners, these are actually calls in or completed online, people uh, looking for help and support. Um, and, um, and when you look at that, when you think of it, going into one, one system, when you're talking about a jump from, from 69,000 to 211,000, that's astronomical. Um, in May 2000, oh, back up. In May 2020, 21,165 depression screeners reported thinking of suicide or self-harm on more than half of the days to nearly every day, with 11,894 reporting uh, these thoughts uh, thoughts nearly every day, which is a this is uh, this is a sobering condition that we're dealing with. Special populations are also experiencing high anxiety and depression, including the LGBTQ population, uh, individuals, caregivers, students, veterans in active duty, and people with chronic health conditions. This isn't just affecting people with anxiety and depression, other mental health conditions too. Among psychosis screeners, oh, um, psychosis screeners in May, more than 16,000 were at risk, and the percentage at risk, 73% also increased. Okay, go ahead. Now, um, part of what has happened is that we have been in a situation where the, the prescription to deal with preventing, act, preventing the COVID virus has been social isolation, staying away from people's large groups, um, wearing masks, but as much as anything, keeping space between folks. And, um, and please note that the data, these three, these three um, areas that you're gonna see here were collected in January of 2019. So this is prior to the COVID uh, pandemic occurring. 
Um, and this is related to seniors, but it really does give a reflection of what I think everybody's experiencing. Uh, Forty-three percent of seniors feel lonely on a regular basis. Forty-five percent increased risk of mortality in seniors who, who report feeling lonely. And this bottom one is a very powerful, profound statement. Loneliness, loneliness is more dangerous than obesity and is damaging to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Think about that. That loneliness and isolation can impact me more so than if I were smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That is, that is such a telling statement about where we are with regard to what we need in our, with regard to our own mental health and mental wellness. Go ahead. Next. Okay. Social isolation, what the science says. As a force in shaping our health, medical care pales in comparison with the circumstances of the communities in which we live. Few aspects of community are more powerful than is the degree of connectedness and social support for individuals. Living alone, being unmarried, single, divorced, widowed, or participation in social groups, fewer friends and strained relationships are not only all risk factors for premature mortality, but also increased risk for loneliness. With retirement and physical impairments may also increase the risk of social isolation. Again, this is data was collected prior to the pandemic. Um, I don't think anybody had any inkling that we would have to deal with what we're dealing with now. I think what we're looking at is a circumstance that um, it's gonna take years for us to really fully understand the, the true impact on the global health of, our, of individuals that were affected by this. And that's excluding actually contracting the COVID virus itself. I think what we're, what we're going to be finding is over time that there's going to be a number of individuals that because of their um, frailty or um, concerns over their own mental, mental wellness, that um, their health is going to decline to a point where we're going to have unprecedented issues that um, I don't think we, we even fully understand. And again, I'm not even, I am not talking about the COVID epidemic and people um, contracting the COVID virus itself. Go ahead. Okay. Also stress. Stress affects the body and mind. And, and again, I, here's the thing. I, I, am, I know I am not saying anything in this that many of you already don't know. Okay. I, I get it. And the, but I think it's important to really take a look at all the aspects of all of this. You know, as, as we look at stress, the effect of stress in the body is complex, touching nearly every major system. When we experience stressful situations, our bodies automatically release hormones that were designed to allow us to react to danger, the classic fight or flight response. For example, veins in the skin constrict to send more blood to the major muscles that allow us to flee or defend ourselves. The physiological, the, that physiological response serves us well. If we're running from a bear, or need to quickly pull, pull a child out of harm's way. Um, we, even with, even with the circumstance where we may have contact with individuals around us, we are dealing with an environment that is, that is wrapped around stress. We may be going out in public, but then we're dealing with, I, a recent example um, in Manatee County, I went into a grocery store and they lifted the, um, requirement in Manatee County to wear a mask. What you were dealing with is, is it was really clear when I looked around, uh, an individual walked in without a mask and someone with a mask yelled at them for not wearing a mask. Um, and they, and the individual said, hey, they, it was lifted in Manatee County. But what's happening is, instead of us being part of a community, we're all kind of walking on eggshells and in a guarded fashion as we deal with what are the expectations of each of us and our own responsibilities and how we handle things. And so we are walking around in levels of stress that none of us were ever really prepared for. Go ahead. Okay, so stress affects the body and mind. When stress levels get out of control, 
and as an example, when they're severe or prolonged, it takes a serious toll on your body. Physical symptoms of stress include a vast number of things, including an increased heart rate, nausea, digestive problems, and dizziness. The effects are more than just physical, though. Chronic stress also affects our emotions and behavior. Some people pick up nervous habits, like pacing or nail biting. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to find out how many of us have started doing certain things that maybe we used to, we, I, I, I have to clip my nails really close, um, and I stopped biting my nails years ago, but then I started again, so I have to clip mine so that I'm not biting my nails again. Um, others might become irritable or agitated. A stress overload can also lead people to substance abuse and ultimately addiction. Um, when we think about this, you know, um, it will be interesting, you know, many of us know about ACE, you know, um, adverse childhood experiences. Um, what will be the score that will attribute to this whole pandemic and students being uh, educated partially at home, partially in schools and back to and fro and all of that environmental impact that we're experiencing. I don't think, um, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what kind of number we give it. Um, if, you know, how this impacts everybody. I think, I think everybody recognizes that there is an impact, but we don't know and we won't know probably again for several years what the full impact is on our children. Um, and on our families. Go ahead, next. What impact has stress uh, from the coronavirus pandemic had on the brain? And this is, this is a um, statistic I found that, or information I found that very intriguing. Social distancing and isolation have characterized many countries' approaches to reducing the spread of coronavirus, depriving many of opportunities for contact essential for well-being and mental health. At the FENS Virtual Forum of Neuroscience in July, um, Andres Meyer Lindenberg, Central Institute of Mental Health, Mannheim, Germany, discussed the impact of the stress experience experienced by the brain during enforced isolation, considering the amplified economic and social conditions unique to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Following investigations surrounding the brain's response to interactions between genetic and environmental risk factors, Meyer Lindbergh emphasized the importance of vigilance in monitoring adverse impacts on mental health under abnormal social conditions. Humans are social creatures, and so social isolation is a form of chronic stress, which has negative impact on hormonal and, in, and immune systems, leading to mental and physical illness, such as cardiovascular disease. The bigger, or so, the bigger our social networks, the better we can cope with adverse situations. The size of these networks predicts the size of the cingulate cortex, which becomes bigger, which means there is a, there is a impact on um, that area of the brain, the cingulate cortex, when uh, we have bigger social networks. Adversely, inversely, if we are depriving ourselves of that, that can negatively impact the size of the cingulate cortex. Uh, an area inciting further investigation with social neuroscience, the cingulate cortex interacts with the amygdala and the hippocampus. This circuit is reported to be impacted heavily by risk genes for depression, among other, among other psychiatric disorders. A larger social network could lead to reduced risk of death by around 50%. Think about that. We have been put in a situation where the treatment may be um, may be uh, more deadly, may be deadlier than the cure. Meyer Lindenberg further explained: there are reportedly approximately one third of Americans and one quarter of Europeans experiencing loneliness at any one time, elevating that risk of depression and dementia. Go ahead. Again. Numerous studies have linked stress and alcohol and drug addiction. In fact, chronic stress is well known as a well-known substance abuse risk factor. Researchers believe that stress causes brain changes with a potential to lead to addiction. For example, stress early in life, such as childhood trauma or stress that's prolonged and repeated affects development of the prefrontal lobe. This is the part of the brain that deals with higher level thinking and impulse control. In addition, Certain mental health disorders, such as depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, are strongly linked to alcohol and drug abuse. 
PTSD can develop in anyone who has experienced severe trauma from, a, from car accident victims to combat veterans. Other anxiety disorders are also connected to higher rates of addiction. Part of what we're also experiencing right now is with, with the pandemic and the responses that we've had to it, um, we, have, we, we have folks that probably otherwise without this would live their lives normally and would not have an impact on their mental health. They may have some struggles from time to time, but they would be probably characterized more as the worried well. Um, now, what we're seeing is, is this is the tipping point. You know, maybe they've been walking on the fence and what much of what has happened since March, if not a little bit prior, has pushed them over the edge. And we are um, experiencing individuals who are now uh, seeking uh, treatment services and supports for their mental health crises that otherwise wouldn't be looking for it. Um, in fact, I think that what we're going to find is that when the dust settles, as we're able to start returning back to normalcy, um, there's going to be a major need for us to support continued access and, and, um, limit, and uh, releasing the requirements for telehealth, meaning that we really do need to make sure that that continues on because we need to provide as much access as possible uh, to care. Go ahead, continue. All right. COVID and you know, when, uh, when a pandemic and an epidemic collide, more than 20 million people in the United States have a substance use disorder. And I would probably respectfully say that that number is probably closer to 32 million, about one in 10. Now, COVID-19 has left many locked down, laid off and flooded with uncertainty. So far, experts see signs of relapses, rising overdoses, and other worries. Anxiety, grief, isolation, financial worries, changes at home and work, and an ongoing sense of uncertainty can all threaten people with substance use disorders, as well as those at risk of developing one. One of the things that we know locally that we're starting to see, and I know that Cameron Boykins is on the call and, uh, with Drug Free Sarasota and collects the data, uh, related to what we see um, related to overdoses, overdose deaths, as it's reported by the Sheriff's Office, as well as uh, the number of Narcan deployments, Narcan being the chemical given to someone who's in an overdose uh, by uh, the EMS. Um, and I can tell you without question, when we compare 2019 to 2020, just looking at the Sheriff's Office data, we have already doubled the number of overdoses and we have, I think we had a total of 13 overdose deaths in 2019 and understand this is just in unincorporated Sarasota County as reported through the Sheriff's Office data. That does not include the municipalities of, Sar of the City of Sarasota, North Fork, Bend. Okay, um, the, so 2019 we had 13 deaths. Year to date, we have had 44, okay, in 2020. So, and here's what's happening. Um, a big part of being in recovery um, is the fellowship, engaging with your peers, people that have been there, done that with you and understand it and experience it. AA meetings, NA meetings, 12-step programs and all kinds of versions but the idea that I'm around the people that I have support from. And we are seeing an unprecedented number of folks that have had long-term recovery relapsing during this period, primarily because guess what? I can't go face-to-face -face for my meetings. My sponsor may have health concerns and I can't be around them. And then if I, and my work is, is at risk and is threatened and I have a lot of stressors, um, I, in fact, um, at this point, um, I think the, the amount of alcohol that is being purchased has gone up 24% nationally, and with hard liquor, it's at 54% nationally. We have a lot of folks that their, all their mechanisms, their fail-safes that help them maintain their recovery have all been stripped away in some capacity. In fact, many of them have made decisions to have face-to-face -face meetings even in the face of the recommendations that did not happen because they had to balance the, the trade-offs. Um, and um, 
you know, I, I got to say, I, I would much rather have someone maintain their recovery and sobriety and risk that. You know, I, I think that we do have to look at those trade offs. Go ahead. All right. So I just quoted what I was saying. Research, okay, so um, researchers say it's too soon to have definitive data on the pandemic's effects, but early numbers are concerning. So far, alcohol sales have risen by more than 25%, and it has gone up for hard liquor, 54%. Um, and then Millennium Health provided some data on 500,000 year analysis drug tests taken during this period. Um, and they're a national lab service. Uh, many, many treatment providers use them, as well as uh, physician groups. Um, what they're finding is an increase of 32% of not for non-prescribed fentanyl in, in the urine tests, 20% increase for methamphetamine, and 10% for cocaine from mid-March through May. And suspected drug overdoses climbed 18%. I think it's going to be much higher than that when it's all said and done during the same period. Um, and that's according to a national tracking system run out of the University of Baltimore. Um, What's, what's not helpful is that um, along with the relapses individuals are experiencing, much of the, um, the drugs that are being purchased on the street, the big four are heroin, fentanyl, methamphetamine, and cocaine, all come from the same uh, delivery mechanisms, the same distributorship, you know, um, the cartels. And um, unfortunately, Sometimes um, they're cutting many of like the methamphetamine and cocaine are stimulants, but it's, and even heroin are being cut with fentanyl and people are overdosing um, uh, without uh, expectation that they were taking any kind of uh, synthetic opiate. So it is a, a major concern. Um, go ahead. Um, all right, in, 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 I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to be as general with this as possible. I am not trying to make it a political football, but I think it's important to recognize that the pandemic is one thing, but the political environment and multiple levels of uh, division are another. Um, some of the things that we're experiencing, a lack of clear direction from leadership at the federal level on down on how to best approach managing the risks, including lots of contradiction leaving us to wonder who should we believe? Who should we, um, what should, what's the reality? What's the truth? Um, social media becoming the diagnostic tool. Um, it's, it's like everywhere you turn, um, social media has become this, the, I mean, it has been uh, larger than life for now, but it has really taken on um, an extra appendage, for lack of a better way of putting it, with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. What should have been a public health approach has become a political tool or a political football. Um, we, um, we, we haven't been able to, at the, at, at, in the United States, really in my opinion, and that's my opinion, address the issue of the COVID pandemic in a way that has been thoughtful, in a way that has been um, pragmatic, and has, um, has left us bewildered and frustrated beyond measure, in my opinion. And there's been lack of consensus on how best to approach mitigating the impact of the virus, back masks versus no masks, safe spacing versus grouping. Um, we've had, I mean, we, you know, um, we, we, we've had individuals who've, who've resisted wearing masks when that has been expressed through, you know, Dr. Fauci and others that that was a simple step that could have prevented many of the issues that have gone on. And not wearing a mask was almost comparable. And this is my term, not anybody else's, as uh, groups wearing or waving a rebel flag or anything like that. I think that we've been, we've been dealing with it as a, um, a stance rather than a health concern. Um, the pandemic has brought on competing crises. We really legitimately right now are dealing with a medical and an economic crisis, and they're actually pitted against each other in many respects. Some of the decisions that have been made to protect people have led to loss of jobs, furloughing, and other things. And it's, it's one of those challenges that, I mean, in our state where we're built on tourism dollars and um, everything else, everything about what we 
needed to do to practice safety was contradictory to how we create our revenue. And we are in, in the human services are likely going to be experiencing this during the next legislative session when decisions are made because of the revenue being down as a, con as a consequence of the, the COVID crisis. Certain populations are at risk, at, at great risk of health crisis, while others barely know they even have the virus. So you can't even put a plate, you know, uh, you can't even say, okay, here's my flag in the sand, and I can say, you know, these are what I can expect if I have it. Some get it, some don't. I had a daughter who was positive, and her only um, symptom was, was a loss of taste and smell for a short period of time. Um, whereas others that I know very close to me have ended up hospitalized and it's been, you know, so what is the, how do you expect any consistency? All right, go ahead. Now, some of the mitigation that has been done with regard to behavioral health that has been practiced and it was done in a, you talk about a, uh, a, a change, a shift that happened exponentially fast. Um, we, uh, those of us who practice in behavioral health and or in medical health, went from face-to-face -face requirements with, very, with a lot of restrictions to thankfully the federal and state governments and local governments all re uh, relinquished all the restrictions on how telehealth can be practiced and organizations ramped up telehealth like nobody's business. It has been remarkable what has been done with that. If there's any silver lining in this, that's, what, that's one of the big ones. Um, providers are seeing improved show rates. While I was still at first step, uh, during the first period, uh, the first quarter that we implemented um, telehealth services, we went from the, pr the prior quarter, we were at 27% no-show rate. It decreased to an 18% no-show rate, which is remarkable. Virtual visits are a good fit for many. Many individuals struggle with transportation and other issues that um, limit their ability to show for face-to-face -face appointments and telehealth has allowed uh, them to be able to keep appointments that they otherwise would not be able to. And also um, for many, sometimes their level of comfort, especially if their uh, disability is such that it um, limits their desire or willingness to be around others, this can help them. Digital connection gets personal. Um, you know, they, the ability to have a relationship and talk with someone in their home environment often leads to that client feeling a bit more comfortable than the structured environment that they experience when they go into um, the counseling centers. Um, and uh, telehealth also links patients and providers to in rural areas and areas that have limited um, clinical access. Um, you know, so I think that that has been a very, very positive experience. Federal and federal state expanded telehealth flexibility allowed providers to maintain operations. Many organizations struggle to keep the doors open, but the Bamber Health providers have been able to maintain uh, effectiveness um, uh, because their ability to provide the telehealth supports. Go ahead. The virtual approach to counteracting implement. Physical distancing, uh, okay, so the other thing that also happened, I'm not gonna read this slide, uh, but it's, it's that um, along with the treatment services, the counseling services, the, the 12 step support groups, including AA, recognize the importance of shifting to making um, meetings available and they have done that through platforms such as Zoom, Google Hangouts, conference calls, GoToMeeting, and WhatsApp. Um, there are a whole cross section of meetings available online now that weren't otherwise available prior. Um, and actually, they, you know, they did have some practice recognizing that there were many areas that did not have access to regular meetings. Um, and by having them online, um, they were able to support individuals. Um, so, you know, that is again, one of the positives that has come out of this. Go ahead. Now, the virtual approach to counteracting the impact there are limitations uh, of virtual connectivity. Many individuals in need do not have access to technology. I think that has been the biggest frustration that many of our patients and clients um, don't have smartphones or don't have the technology necessary um, to be able to connect and, have, and, we ha and accommodations have to be made. 
First Step uh, did a wonderful thing where they set up kiosks in several of their outpatient locations so that the individuals could come in, sit at the kiosk and have their access to their psychiatric appointment tele through telehealth. The home of the client may not be the safest place for therapy. I think about individuals in a domestic violence situation in the telehealth environment trying to communicate in a safe way without putting themselves at risk while maybe the perpetrator is in and around where they are. Um, I know many individuals who, many therapists, set up in advance safe words so that they know that they can communicate and know what they can and cannot talk about during those, during those virtual visits. Many in the recovery community are struggling with not having direct contact with the fellowship, putting them at risk of relapse. I know that we have clients that are showing up for virtual groups, but many of them are saying, God, I can't wait to get back to face to face. I can't wait till I can be around and have that human contact. And it is so, it is so valuable. Practitioners are also uh, are experiencing virtual burnout when working from home. I don't know about you, but um, I know for me, when I had different meetings, at least I had that drive time right had between a meeting, and I could stop and grab a you know um, a granola bar or a soda or something, you know, kind of get respite. Now meetings are stacked on top of each other. On top, I mean, they are back to back to back, and we have become Zoom zombies. In many respects, you know, we are kind of overwhelming ourselves, and I and because this is so new, we haven't figured out kind of what are the protocols we need to put in place that provide that virtual self care in terms of the Zoom therapeutic world. Uh, also, technology issues uh, like poor video or audio quality, bandwidth is a major concern for many. You know, if if you're in an area where you have limited um, uh, uh, internet access, it can be so frustrating to have choppy therapeutic sessions and it can be just totally i've actually known therapists who have switched from their computers to their cell phones to do therapy because they get better access to their phones than they do on the computers limits on therapists ability to pick up on nonverbal cues this is a really important thing um, many of us when we're doing individual and group therapy when we're in face to face we do have that ability to see you know the difference between what is coming out ver verbally versus what is being exhibited by their body language and it's a challenge to pick up on those signals when you're dealing with uh, virtual therapy and verification of sobriety through access to drug screening limited we haven't yet quite figured out, you know, can we urinate on our phone to get a drug screen? We have, we don't have that skill yet. Sorry for the crassness, but that's what we're dealing with. You know, we're, we have some struggles now. Um, I know at First Step and other organizations are setting up very structured schedules so that they can have individuals come in and test, but there's not the same mask, bring them all in, get them tested and get them out. It is really, you know, so it limits how often you can do drug screens when it could be a very important thing. All right, go ahead. All right, now I wanna talk about some considerations for self-care during the pandemic for all of us that are dealing with this crisis and still trying to be help in the helping professions and help our individuals. Um, and the two areas I'm gonna cover briefly are the power of ritual and five evidence-based practices for self-care. I will share with you um, over the last couple of years and especially over the last uh, 10 months or so, I have become uh, a podcast junkie. Um, I listen to podcasts all the time in varying forms from crazy things, but there's a number of them that I have found that are really powerful in the areas of self-care and uh, I think are important to consider. Go ahead. All right, the power of ritual. Um, when we think about ritual, I think it's important to first talk about a couple things that are similar but are, are really indifferent. There's superstition, the fear-based repetitive practice. Tonight, the Tampa Bay Rays will begin their trek to win the World Series against those dang Los Angeles Dodgers. I can't stand them. Sorry, I won't go there. But here's what we've got. There you will see individuals practicing things so that they don't strike out so that they don't have, they have things that you do. Think about things that maybe you do. Um, like maybe you carry a penny in your pocket because you're trying to not have bad luck. Um, 
You know, we do things on a regular basis to prevent something that scares us or worries us or we're, fe or we're fearful of. Then there's habit. Um, mindless repetitive practice. Habit is, um, you know, this morning you probably brushed your teeth, but you don't even remember it. You know you did certain things that you, you know that you do pretty much every day. Um, it has become a default setting of how you behave, but to have you go through and remember it all probably is not likely. Then we get to ritual, which is the mindful repetitive, which is mindful repetitive practice. Go ahead. What that entails, uh, mindful acts done with deliberate intention and focus that we actually are giving active thought to what we're practicing, what we're doing, the steps we're taking. Multiple focus involve different elements and activities. They include multiple habits. Um, rituals are, are valuable in, in, in reshaping how we think about things. It's very much consistent with how we, um, many of us know about mindfulness. Rituals are the active display of mindfulness. And they're system oriented, a sequence of activities that are performed in a particular place and according to a set progression. Um, these are often the things that we can do, it, that rituals are what prepare us for the next thing to happen. Um, in fact, uh, what I did prior to preparing for this, um, you know, some of the things I do, um, you know, doing some deep breathing and other things before I do a presentation, um, I have some conscious steps I take to ensure that I, I can hold myself together when I'm doing a presentation and don't um, lose it or get freaked out. Um, and when I have rushed and found myself in a situation where I haven't been able to practice my own personal ritual, I have noticed my stress levels, my, um, my, um, you know, my um, uh, embarrassment or other things goes up because I have not done what I needed to do to prepare myself. Go ahead. Um, and this is why uh, rituals are important. Rituals increase appreciation. When you're being mindful about things, um, we, can, we can take things and really give value to them. Rituals transform the mundane. They take the very simple and maybe many of us may think boring and make it something of value. Um, you know, there's, there's practices that you can do that are simple but can really give you a sense of, a, uh, a sense of, and I say appreciation and uh, um, it, we'll just leave it at that. Rituals help celebrate life. Um, you know, many of the things that we do often go without thought, and, um, but when we talk about where we wanna go with celebrating what we do on a regular basis. If you get into practice of rituals, it gives you a chance to celebrate each day, setting up a time where you will have, have give yourself a chance to be in a positive mindset. And rituals build a stronger community. If you're able to have rituals and then share with others what those might be and maybe even practice them. Um, Here's an example. Maybe you go exercise or maybe you go do a yoga class or something with a group. And there are yoga classes that provide appropriate spacing and other things like that. But if you, if you take the mindset, instead of it being, I'm just going, to using it as a mindful practice and make it part of your ritual, you can make it have even more meaning than just that physical exercise that you're experiencing. And rituals help us jump into action. Sometimes we get into this um, ambivalent state of where we are with make that really taking an active step on something that's positive for us. Consider establishing a ritual prior to that that will help to effectively move you forward into that activity. Okay? Go ahead. All right. Um, <clears throat> this, these, these five evidence-based strategies that are next, um, there's a... Dr. Lori Santos is a professor at Yale University, um, and she is a she she studies actually primates and how they respond in terms of happiness and other things like that. But she also um, has uh, classes on 
on happiness. In fact, um, her class, uh, her class on happiness at Yale University is the most popular class ever in the history of, of Yale. Um, and now it is, it's actually a class you can take online um, and it is now the most popular online class ever posted online. And it's a, it's a uh, remarkable thing. And what I have discovered is she actually has a podcast called The Happiness Lab. I invite you to consider, I get no remuneration, remuneration from it, but I want you to consider it. And one of the things that she talks about, in fact, she even has a whole um, series of podcasts on how to manage through the COVID epidemic. And uh, I just wanted to cover these five steps uh, that help with uh, the impact of COVID in isolation. <clears throat> First off, three deep belly breaths. When I, I had a slide previously on stress and about our fight or flight response, which shortens our breath, it causes our blood pressure to go up and it causes our digestive systems to kind of shut down a bit and to limit what happens. Well, one of the best ways you can hack your system and to inf in infect change is through very, very simply three deep belly breaths. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that with you. That's, you know, you can do that yourselves, but it really does help because what happens when you do that, your, your physiology responds to those breaths as though it's, you're sending a signal that you're calming, digestion can reoccur, restart back up, your blood pressure can go down, and it's just as simple as those three deep belly breaths. Second, acts of kindness. What, um, you know, it's funny, many of what is being talked about during this epidemic is to make sure you do self-care. But one of the healthiest things we can do is other care and giving to others and being helpful with others. Some, some very simple things and finding your way. And many of us do that as a profession, but it's even beyond that. Um, simple things such as opening a door on a regular basis, even um, uh, <clears throat> Chris Harmon, who is uh, the director, she's the um, outpatient director at First Step, um, while I was there, uh, shared with me one day that she on a regular basis, when she goes to the drive-thru at Starbucks, she'll pay for the, the coffee for the person behind her. Um, and uh, with no expectation of, you know, gratitude or anything, the, the, it, it really does, it, acts of kindness, giving to others is actually a very, can be a very selfish thing because biochemically and otherwise, it is a healing and healthy thing for us. And I, I invite you to consider any way you could do that, whether it be volunteering in some capacity, and I know there are limitations in the current environment, but there are things that you can do that can, um, can really help with that. And focus on what you control. The serenity prayer is right, okay? We have, so, in fact, my recommendation is, especially right now in this current environment, social media is, in my opinion, one of the most unhealthy things we can be dealing with right now. Um, and I would say, if you can't control it and it's driving you crazy, turn it off, tune out, disengage from the social media chaos that we're experiencing. I think that's one very simple thing that we can do um, to um, help ourselves. Exercise, and this is one that everybody hears on a regular basis, exercise, healthy food, and sleep. We have to recognize that that is something that, by and large, I know it's a default setting, but I think we need to recognize that we need to continue considering that. And then fifth, gratitude. Um, I know for myself, I don't, uh, I, I don't do conscious practice of gratitude as much as I do, as I, sh as I would like to. But when I do, my whole day changes. When I'm able to be experience uh, gratitude for the things in my life, for my family, for my spouse, for my friends, for each of you, um, there's so much power in that. There is so much that can help us redirect and reframe where the world is coming at because it is coming with such negativity. And I think we have to uh, take those baby snips of recognizing baby steps of recognizing what is helpful and useful to us. Okay, next. 
All right, here are some available supports that I give to you that, um, um, Sarah, can this be emailed out to everybody, this, this PowerPoint? I, uh, hopefully everybody can share this because those links actually work. You can click on those and link to those um, services and supports. And I think the next slide is just uh, references. Yep, um, and you can find all the things that I've referenced in this. And um, let's just open it up for uh, questions. Uh, Dr. Hill, you were gonna lead the way with questions and what time we have left. You're on mute. Still on mute. I wish I could read Dr. Hill's lips, but I can't. Um, there we go. The, the, host, the host is all powerful and has to unmute me. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, uh, PJ. I think that your presentation uh, was excellent. Uh, much as you said at the very beginning, we have heard before, but we really need to hear it um, more than once. Uh, two comments, and I, I did see a couple of questions. One was, um, how do you think the problems of racial justice also play into COVID and addiction during this period of time? I've heard, uh, individuals say enough is enough could you comment on that please yeah you know it's it's um i think it i think it it, it just is another um major aspect and um impact and, and influencer of what's going on in this current environment you know i i don't want to discount it but the truth is is as you can see by my skin um, you know, I'm, I'm in a, you know, in a privileged situation by, by the fact that I'm just a white male, you know, being in that. And I really think what's going on right now is all the, all the negativity that's being fed into and it fits in with what we're dealing with is not, it's, it's, it's not fully recognizing the historical and other perspectives that being in a, mi in a minority class, being in that situation is, is such that, and, and again, um, one of the things that's happened, it's not just uh, for those who are, uh, uh, you know, African-American, um, you know, at the, at the peak of the pandemic, many uh, uh, individuals of Asian descent were also being isolated and ostracized a bit because of where it supposedly started from. Um, and I think that what we're dealing with is, is that um, we, we have to recognize that the, the COVID experience is um, an escalated experience among many minority populations in terms of risk factors and things like that. I think it, you're, you're right in that we have the COVID epidemic, clearly. We have a, a racial injustice epidemic as well. And then we have vulnerable individuals for substance abuse and addiction. And I believe that those three, plus homelessness, uh, et cetera, uh, really can push one over the edge. Not only those three, but even just one could push someone over the edge. The other question I see is, how do we deal with mixed messages? And we get so many mixed messages. We got some today on the air. Uh, let's believe the scientists, let's not believe the scientists. And those on this call are intelligent, professional individuals. But some of the patients that we see hear this mixed messaging and say, threw up their hands and say, I just don't know what to believe. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, um, my, my opinion is that we have to look to the practicing professionals who are giving us, such as, I'm going to use Dr. Fauci as an example, um, individuals such as him who, um, and organizations such as CDC, even though there have been some questions, 
I think we have to we have to really look to the um, professional systems that have been established to um, as much as possible work outside of politics and provide us as much guidance as necessary. Um, but even that sometimes is a bit of a challenge. I don't. I, I'm at a quandary a bit with that um, because of um, the politics of now. The and and unfortunately we're in a we're in a political climate that wants to point fingers at everybody else rather than taking responsibility and ownership. Um, and uh, the accountability level is is at an all time low. Another comment was uh, your slide in regards to what we can do to help ourselves. Uh, clearly, there are times when all of us uh, feel uh, lonely or when is this going to end? Or I really would like to see my mom or dad or grandchildren, or um, I really would like a hug. And unfortunately, sometimes we cannot do that. Uh, one solution to that is to mask up and do it. And I've heard that said more than once. There, there probably is nothing wrong with seeing your grandchildren out in the driveway. And I've been known to receive food from my children and grandchildren out in the driveway. But we have to think of those five things that you mentioned, which I think are so, so critically important. And as care providers, uh, take care of ourselves. And, and uh, We've, we've, we've heard them all before, and we've heard uh, different versions of them, but uh, we need to keep it in mind. A gratitude going through Starbucks and uh, giving uh, uh, a free coffee to the person behind you, and not only gives somebody a free cup of coffee, but it really makes you feel good. Any other questions in the chat, um, Sarah, since I, I don't know how to work the chat? <laughs> Just questions about if the slides were being shared, um, and those will be on the website um, at Healthy Start. The other point of those five things is, you know, we can't change someone else's behavior or control it. And I think focusing on what we can do is so uh, valuable. I'd be interested in anyone else's uh, uh, comment. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. This is gonna, I'm gonna get with the politics of now, the zeitgeist of the way, you know, don't be a Karen. My wife's name is Karen. You know, um, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't get into pointing fingers at, I think we're stuck in blaming. And part of what we can, and so what that does is, is it puts things out of our control and it makes us victims. Um, control what you can of yourself. If someone's not wearing a mask and you are, you're doing what you need to do for yourself. What that person chooses to do is what that person chooses to do. Um, you know, we are, we are in an environment where I think that's enough work. I think if, if, if we had it all perfected, we wouldn't be dealing with all of this. But since we don't, just manage what you can manage within your own personal sphere. Um, and, and I really think it's about connecting with the people that you care about, too. I think if you can find the gratitude and the connectivity and the kindness, when you start practicing, practicing those actively, you have less time to worry about all the other negativity. And you find it has no power over you. And we don't want to give power to the negative. I want to thank uh, PJ. I know he has another session that he has to uh, get to. I want to thank PJ for not only this uh, presentation, but for his support uh, of the pregnant patient and the many efforts that we are doing at the hospital uh, when he was at first step, and uh, certainly for his uh, strong leadership in our Sarasota community on behavioral health. So PJ, thank you. And thank you everybody. Our paths will continue to cross. Yes, they will. Uh, it's yeah. one o'clock and we did a perfect job. Uh, this was the first of um, five Lunch and Learns. Uh, the next one will be next week. It's on the MORE initiative, 
maternal opioid recovery effort. This is an initiative from the Florida Quality uh, Collaborative based out of Tampa. Betsy Wood and Bill Sappenfield and Lori Rees will talk to us about the maternal opioid recovery effort, better known as uh, MORE. I want to thank uh, Sarah Olison, uh, who expertise in getting us out there for everyone has been superb. We look forward to seeing you uh, next week and please uh, stay safe.